Hi, and welcome to this Being with Women and Digital Technology webinar for midwives, co-hosted by the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Federation and the Australian Digital Health Agency. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people, traditional custodians of the land on which we host this webinar today, and pay respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who have joined us today. If you would like to take a moment to acknowledge the country from which you join us today, we welcome you to add it to the chat box. My name is Naomi Riley, and I will be facilitating the webinar today. I am a professional officer of the ANMF, and I'm also a nurse, midwife, and maternal and child health nurse based in Victoria. In this webinar, we would like to explore how access to data and information sharing through digital technology may enhance midwifery care and transitions for women and their families across healthcare providers. We are going to start by exploring the pitfalls and challenges of data access and information sharing in maternity services. The Australian Digital Health Agency are then going to provide an update on digital health developments they are working on to support data and information sharing across health services. And then we will look at what utilising digital health developments to support data and information sharing could look like in midwifery practice. We will finish with questions and closing remarks. Following on from the webinar, you will be sent a link to a short evaluation. We would appreciate it if you could provide some feedback. If you have questions, there will be time towards the end of the webinar to discuss these, and we invite you to post them, them in the chat box. I would now like to introduce you to our panellists. Vandana, would you like to start us off? Sure. Um, firstly, thanks Naomi and the ANMF team for the opportunity. My name is um, Vandana. I am a I work at the Australian Digital Health Agency, so I lead a team of educators, um, and I've sort of been working at the at the agency for about five years, and um, I'm a pharmacist by background. Thanks, Thank Naomi. you, Vandana. It's, it's going to be great to hear perspectives as a consumer in a little bit, and also um, from the ADHA. Alison, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, uh, my name's Alison Wallbank. Uh, I'm a, I've been working as a nurse and a midwife for 24 years. So as a midwife in metro and regional locations for about 10 years, and then a child and family health clinician and numb for the last 10 years. Um, I've worked in the COVID response team for the last year with the COVID blip we've just gone through um, as an operational nurse manager. And I've joined Tresillion in February this year as their clinical nurse consultant in child and family health. Uh, which is a secondary parenting support service where um, primary health can't support families. Thanks, Alison, for joining us today and for sharing your experiences of women and families transitioning to community care. I think it will be invaluable to the discussion. Thanks. And lastly, Marianne, can you tell us a bit about yourself? I'm from Townsville. I'm joining you from Bindal and Wilguru Kaba land. I'm a caseload midwife working in an all-risk midwifery group practice model in a regional tertiary public hospital. And I've been in my clinical role for six years. The last four years, I've been involved in midwifery research and one day a week, I work as a nurse midwife researcher. Some of our current research involves exploring the impact of the electronic medical record on contemporary midwifery practice. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this webinar today. Thanks, Marianne. I think that your work in the electronic um, medical history records will be very valuable to the, the ADHA information. So thank you for joining us today. So firstly, we're going to take a quick look at the pitfalls and challenges of data and information sharing in maternity services. Um, Vandana is going to start off by sharing her recent experience as a user of maternity care services. Over to you. Thanks again, Naomi. So look, um, what I'm about to share is just my, my sort of experience from pregnancy to motherhood and beyond, which has been fun most of the times, but obviously I'm, I'm sure as most of you would appreciate it, it can sort of get quite nerve wracking um, at times and frustrating um, at other times. So um, overall, I had a very smooth pregnancy, um, sort of, you know, like you do usually just attend your specialist appointment 
appointments, had various scans, blood reports, etc. I engaged with um, multiple healthcare providers, so um, be it specialists, um, GP, of course, uh, quite a few allied healthcare providers. Um, and I think, look, you know, considering my background, so I'm a pharmacist, um, I knew um, how to sort of maintain all of that information. I had a hard copy with me. Um, I've got a My Health record, so I made sure where possible I had information in there. Um, but what I sort of experienced is from time to time, I was the, the sole source of information um, and I had to sort of volunteer and provide that information to healthcare providers I was working with. So for instance, um, my specialist maintained all of the, the, the results of my, my scans and blood reports. But when I saw my GP, I was then, um, when I asked her, she of course didn't have access to all of that information. So I was sort of then being the media mediator, making sure she had that information so I didn't have to repeat all of the um, uh, the, the reports. Um, I had I um, chose to have a plan C section. Um, and it was quite interesting because at pre-admission, it was me asking, well, um, I've done X, Y, and Z, um, and whether or not they had all the information. So again, I was sort of helping them um, make sure that, you know, all of the information they needed. And when they asked me, I said, well, look, this, um, whether it was my specialist that they should have, they, they might have that information or somebody else could provide that information to them. Um, and so then at discharge, um, I was handed a piece of paper, a stash of medicines um, and um, a blue book. So I'm based in, in New South Wales. Um, and of course, I was aware that the blue book um, was very important. It sort of maintains a copy of all of the information. So I carried that all. Uh, carried that book to all of my appointments. We've traveled a fair bit, both national and international. So again, um, I, I took that with me everywhere. Um, and then I think, look, um, like you'd expect, everything was going pretty smooth. But then on day seven, um, we had to take my little um, girl to um, the children's hospital. And um, that's when things sort of got out of control because I was, um, I was very anxious. I was panicking. Um, I was the only parent who was allowed to go inside with my little girl. My husband was waiting outside. And um, there were sort of multiple healthcare providers asking me for information information and I sort of repeated the same information again and again. They didn't have access to the discharge summary from um, the hospital where, where I had the baby. Um, they didn't have any information on um, what the C-section was or, or you know whether it was a, a successful surgery, whether there were any complications. So I, I was trying to recall and make sure they had all of the information they needed um, uh, they needed sort of to, to monitor and make sure that the baby, that my baby got the right treatment. Um, and so really in that state of stress, as you'd imagine, um, I, I sort of didn't think about how else they could get that information. Of course, the general practice, my GP was, um, uh, was away, it was after hours, um, and I was the only source of information. So um, there again, you know, uh, with, at the hospital, multiple healthcare providers, the triage nurse, other nurses monitoring the vitals, that the doctor there uh, were all after the same information. So here I was thinking, well, how good it would, how, how sort of powerful would it be if they had the access to my health record, which is a national database, um, and if they could if they could view some of the, the critical information and then be asking relevant questions. So whether asking, you know, what sort of, rather than saying, what sort of tests have you had, if they looked at the reports and asked other information, relevant or sort of relevant questions. So, and that continued. So I attended specialist appointments or GP after, um, some allied healthcare providers. And what was really apparent was that the connection between healthcare providers was a gap. Um, there was no sort of sharing of information between healthcare providers. Um, and I constantly thought about how can I, how, how can the system help these providers get connected, number one, which would mean that they'd be having sort of relevant conversation with the consumer sitting in front of them. It was about efficiency. It was about making decisions really quickly.
Um, so look, I can continue and I've got um, lots of other examples to share, Naomi, but I'm conscious of time. So It is my- a bit tough. Yeah, thank you, Vendano. That was um, really, really um, good example for us to be able to see the risks of information and data being lost between healthcare providers and the burden on women and families in in holding this information and ensuring that the important bits of information on which further assessments and treatments are um, uh, provided uh, is on accurate information. Um, Marianne, what's your perspective on how healthcare data is accessed and shared between providers in your work? Yeah, thank you, Andana. That was such a good sort of, um, you know, you painted the picture well of what, what the current status is on, on the, the, you know, sharing of health record in Australia. Um, this is a big topic and it affects midwives, whether they work in hospital or community settings on the floor or in management. And that's why it's so great that the ANMF is initiating this conversation in this webinar today. And I'm interested to hear what uh, other midwives working elsewhere in Australia, what their experiences are. And there are just so many ways that electronic medical record and information sharing could be done better. And Vandana just sort of illustrated that. Maternity services across Australia have introduced health information technology and the way we now communicate with colleagues internally within the organisation is changing because of the electronic medical record, while the ways we communicate and share data, health data with external service providers um, and the women themselves remain largely analogue, underdeveloped or even backward. So there are a multitude of different medical record systems out there and maternity services across Australia use different systems. And many maternity services have implemented electronic medical records. So in public hospitals, the electronic medical record system may be the same um, you know, for the whole state uh, or territory, but it's only implemented in metropolitan and large uh, regional maternity services, while rural and remote sites remain paper-based. Childbearing women in rural and remote Australia continue to be required to travel to access birthing services, and these women experience fragmented care and also fragmented medical records. Uh, Electronic medical record is one strategy proposed to improve communication and continuity of care for rural and remote childbearing women, but we are not there yet. Um, Queensland Health, for example, um, they say they have a 10 year plan. So other maternity care providers such as private hospitals, um, Aboriginal controlled health services, uh, not not for profit organizations and GPs all use their own IT systems and none of these systems talk to each other. So midwives and other maternity care providers are left with faxing, scanning, downloading and printing paper copies from one electronic system in order to upload it to another. That's the reality on the ground. Um, information sharing with the women in our care is in some ways has in some ways gone backwards. You know, the, the handheld pregnancy health record, which has been around since just post-war, and there's a philosophy behind that about shared, um, you know, shared decision making with women. That's been taken away from women again with the with the introduction of the electronic medical electronic medical record. Uh, women and uh, other healthcare consumers have the right to access information held in their medical record, but they need to apply in order to access it. Mm. So women currently are relying on the verbal information they receive from their midwife or doctor during the antenatal appointments and, and are given few, often incomplete, in printouts of their health data uh, during antenatal care and also postpartum, just like Vandana yeah. said. Yeah, I think that you've made some really good points there, Marianne, about how the information um, gets lost along the way and that you know some of the power has been taken away from women and that as midwives and um, maternal and child health nurses, we do spend a lot of information transferring the information from one IT system to another. Alison, um, with your perspective of working in, in the community, do you have anything to add? Yes, um, well, actually, I can totally relate to everything that Vandana and Marianne have just said. Um, The systems not speaking to each other, so going across from private hospitals, often, you know, the scanned report doesn't arrive until after the child and family health nurse has already been to see the family. Even within the same local health district, where allied health right in the document, you know, in the electronic medical record compared to where uh, nurses right is slightly different. The hospital system is slightly different to the community system. From I'm based in Sydney, um, 
And so within New South Wales, each local health district has a different um, version of the electronic medical record and which don't speak to each other. So working within Tresillian, um, where we sit across many local health districts, the information doesn't pass across. Um, even within Tresillian, we've got a really great online referral system, uh, but that doesn't speak to the electronic medical record. So as you just said, Naomi, it's a lot of transcribing by clinicians, um, the blue book, uh, as Vandana said, you know, and actually, and Marianne was just saying about client held notes, um, they're not often as detailed as you would give when you were providing a clinical handover to another clinician. They're a, a kind of a broken down version of what actually happened. So, mm. yes, it's great that there is a way for families to communicate between clinicians, but it's not as good as if we had a universal system that we were all using. That's right. Thank you, Alison. So, it, you know, I think um, we're going to hear now from the Australian Digital Health Agency perhaps a little bit of information about um, some of the work they're doing that, that may address some of these pitfalls and challenges that um, we have in maternity services about continuity of information and um, information sharing and improving services for families. So I'll hand over to you, Vandana. Do you want it? Yeah, sure. Um, so, look, I, if we can, um, I'll, I'm conscious of time. So what I'll go through is firstly provide a brief update on my health record. Um, and then we can sort of um, just, I'll talk about some um, uh, new sort of features that are currently uh, being considered and, and there's a few underway. So um, as most of you would be aware, my health record is um, essentially an online summary of an individual's health information. So it's not intended to be a complete record Record. So it's not about having all of the information um, from the doctor visits or um, from specialists to allied health. It is about just having a, a summary of key relevant information within their um, My Health record. It is personally controlled. So that means the individual does have a say in what gets uploaded um, and they can manage that. They can see who has viewed their My Health record. Um, it is part of a national system. So what that means is um, healthcare providers that are registered um, for my health record, they, they, they can view that information uh, for the provision of healthcare. Um, like you'd expect with other systems, it is accessible at all times um, and protected by um, strict legislation. So there are um, significant penalties for misuse um, and the legislation is quite crystal clear that the, the My Health record is, um, is uh, the data within the My Health record is only intended for the provision of healthcare. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. So um, this slide essentially captures the range of um, information that's included within the My Health record. So as you can see on this slide here, there's three broad sources, um, consumer documents, Medicare information, and the provider documents. So really um, the provider documents just highlights the range of different documents that um, healthcare providers can upload. We've got majority of general practices, um, pharmacies across the country, um, hospitals uploading discharge summaries by default. So what we do see is um, sort of there is quite a, um, a significant volume of um, medicines information uploaded within the My Health record. And look, I just want to point that within the Medicare documents, um, the Australian Immunization Register, so that, and, and I'll talk about the immunization view in a minute, but we are seeing more and more sort of um, information filter through um, and the MBS um, information which would be quite relevant for this audience. Um, and so I'll talk about the, the consolidated views. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide, which has the medicines information view. Um, so look, with the medicines information view, this is, um, it's a consolidated view and essentially um, it includes um, medicines information from a, a range of documents. So whether that be discharge summaries uploaded by hospitals, um, shared 
health summary uploaded by um, the um, the GP who some you know who's in most cases is the nominated healthcare provider event summaries um, like you can see on the screen there so um, it, it's a really useful view which gives um, the healthcare provider sort of a, a, a snapshot um, and they can then kind of get a sense on uh, the medicines the consumer might be taking it shows them as you can see at the top there there is the um, the navigation panel which um, highlights when the most recent shared health summary was uploaded uh, when the discharge summary was uploaded so what we sort of um, see is healthcare providers tend to access the medicines view once they have an idea as to what medicines the consumer might be taking they can then click on other documents like your shared health summary the discharge summary or other documents within the the view itself and start to sort of see um, uh, see other information. So the medicines view, like I said, is, is one of the most um, accessed um, view within the My Health record. Um, on the next slide, we've got the pathology reports overview. So um, essentially what this view does is it consolidates all of the pathology. So we've also got the, so the, um, the, pathology reports can be grouped by um, by dates as well like like you can see on the screen there by test name so the benefit of this view is um, that again very quickly you can see when some of the um, the patho when uh, the tests were done rather than filtering through individual reports um, a healthcare provider can quickly see when the report was initially done and perhaps it was repeated so this sort of was introduced a few years ago and is again one of the uh, the well sort of um, accessed views within the my health record then on the next slide we have um, the immunization consolidated view so in response to COVID-19 a number of features were sort of um, added to the my health record and this was one of them so essentially um, the immunization information was available within the my health record but that was just um, the air data that sit within Medicare, but we've got a, a consolidated immunization view, which pulls immunization information from a range of documents. And again, like you can see there, um, it'll sort of show um, when the most recent shared health summary was uploaded. If an immunization was included in an event summary, which let's say was uploaded by an after hours doctor, um, then that would also be highlighted within the immunization view. Um, and what I think um, is quite sort of beneficial within this view is um, healthcare providers can see when the next immunization is due. Um, so it will also then highlight the, the date it's due. So, uh, you know, this is where um, for consumers, and I, I, I mean, we don't have time to sort of show you that this afternoon, but the consumers can also see all of this information and print certificates from the My Health record. Next, we have the Medicare documents. So um, within this sort of view, what nurses and midwives would be able to see is some item numbers which may demonstrate whether a care plan is already in place. So what we sort of um, get a lot of questions about is how can healthcare providers see what plan, what care plans are already in place and whether they can use this information to see if a consumer was eligible um, for, for a care plan. So again, this is a very useful useful um, view and uh, there is again a number of kind of different um, uh, you know there's other other information included within the Medicare overview and look all of this information is included within uh, is included on our website so um, we'll be more than happy to share some of this information with you but I'd suggest you um, look at the agency's website for further information on some of these views. Next slide. Um, and look, I'll wrap up um, just with this slide that shows we've got um, an extensive um, education um, uh, sort of, you know, uh, products and um, we've got training modules, we host um, events on a regular basis. So for nursing and midwifery, you can see we've got modules there, but there is a, a whole sort of um, host of events that the education team runs um, and you'd be more than welcome to, to attend those for further information.
Thanks so much. Thank you. (laughs) Thanks so much for Dana. It was very interesting um, update that you provided us. Um, Next, we're going to have a little bit of a look at how digital technology that Vandana has been telling us about could be used in midwifery practice. And Marianne and Alison are going to provide a little bit of insight into what is happening in their spaces. Marianne, in your research, what support did midwives report they needed to to increase digital technology use in practice? Yeah, just really quickly, definitely improvements to the software and the hardware. So in the research we've done, it's with one particular um, electronic medical record system and uh, um, it needs... um, it needs to be adapted to the local context and that mm. is you know uh, birthing um, birthing suites uh, midwives um working in a really different setting than other nursing disciplines medical disciplines um, yeah. so we've that's been called on uh, by the midwives that were in, involved in our research and uh, with the hardware it's the just um you know we're relying on stationary computers and computers on wheels and and, and some laptops but midwives they kneel at the side of the bath they're in the shower with women on all fours and uh, we are in the community holding heavy equipment in in warm weather so we really need uh, improved uh, you know software uh, solutions for how to uh, document in that electronic medical record on the go uh, where we are so we can remain with the woman whether that is on the bathroom floor or in their living room at home yeah i think that the um the mobility of midwifery services really does reflect that need for technology to to match it. And Alison, um, can you share an example of how digital technology is being used within your organisation? Yeah, so I was going to just say COVID for all its downfalls, it actually really progressed, um, I think, in nursing, um, digital skills. I um, was working, as I said, in the COVID response team. We had a heap of staff getting sick with COVID or being in social isolation and to manage that much, um, well, rostering really, (laughs) um, we were able to implement a, you know, use of a spreadsheet that was through Teams so people could be accessing and working on it all the time. And then when I joined Tresillion, I was able to bring that technology into Tresillion and replace, you know, an old paper-based diary that was being used for um, information sharing and now that's implemented a much more effective way for um, clinicians and managers to communicate information that's we need for our funding um, to to you know to share information across sites because you know we are spread right across New South Wales yeah Um, yeah it's been um, it's been really helpful Thank you for that insight so there's a a lot of potential for digital technology to be utilized to help our work both manage um, providing a service um, in getting the staff there but also being able to support midwives to do the work with women we just need a few things to get it up and running if only it was if only if it was that easy Um, (laughs) I'm wary of the time we've just hit three o'clock and we're going to um, have a look at some questions now that people have asked Um, the first one is and um, I invite our panelists to answer these how would digital communication improve the experience of women living and birthing in remote areas um, Marianne, do you think maybe you'd be best placed to answer that question? Yeah, and I saw that question, and I, it's great. And I, I don't think it's answered. I don't. I, I don't know. Um, we know what research has been done, um, and that, that the statement I made about improving continuity of care for women, you know, uh, living rural and remote, that is a statement based, uh, you know, from from government agencies. Um, but um, uh, we know that uh, women in rural and remote Australia, Aboriginal communities, wherever you know, wherever women are, they have access to smartphones, they use smartphones, they rely on apps for health information, women use apps um, as well. So that work is, it has occurred. So we have, uh, you know, done a lot of scoping uh, among women. And so they definitely um, uh, want health information and they want access to health information in a, in a digital, digital formats. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I, Good question about whether it actually, you know, it, I haven't seen any proof of how exactly digital technology and electronic medical records helps them, except for what I've 
heard at the recent conference of the Australian College of Midwives did in Cairns, and um, there were clinicians from Western Australia um, presenting how they are using um, IT to help communicate with rural, uh, like far, very remote sites, providing maternity services. So there is so much potential for technology in IT in 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 the maternity services. But yeah, we've 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 just have a lot of work to do, and and I think mm. we've highlighted that today. Yeah, definitely. Um, another question that we've had is as as a midwife, um, you know, can can we access a woman's information and data via their my health record? Bandana, do you think you're best placed to answer that one? Sorry, so can you repeat that question, Naomi? As a midwife, can I access women's information and data via their health record? Yeah, look, there is, um, there's, of course, um, ways in which um, that's absolutely possible, but for that to happen, depending on where um, the midwife's working. So um, hospitals have um, processes in place. Um, so what they would need to do is give their employees access to view the My Health record, and every hospital is different. So, you know, it, it will vary from, um, uh, from hospital to hospital. Uh, but if for um, practitioners working privately, there are steps that you would need to complete to then get connected um, and start sort of accessing my health record. And look, uh, you know, there is so much more information to share about mm. how providers can get on board. And what I can just say simply is um, that there's, there's uh, you know, the registration process to get on board is a very important one because that sort of is the, the backbone of my health record that ensures that all of the information within my health record is safe and secure so that step is absolutely essential uh, but there's lots of help out there for practitioners who are working privately and want to get connected there is resources and they in, in which the agency can certainly help those uh, providers yeah great thank you um just in the interest of time i think that we might um uh, wrap it up thank you for an interesting discussion um I'd, I'd like to ask our panellists to provide a quick tip or practical step for midwives to progress their uptake of digital health technologies. Vandana, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. So, look, what I'd say is um, depending on where you're working, whether it's hospital, um, privately or any other setting, maybe the question to ask is, is my organisation connected to my health record? And if they are, start the discussion as to how you can um, access my health record. And if you're looking for resources, then please do visit our website. Great. Thank you very much. Marianne? Uh, no, thank you for getting us together today. I think that's what we need to do as midwives and, and with our consumers and uh, other agencies. We need to, you know, elevate, um, you know, where we're at when it comes to digital technology in, in, this, in maternity services. And we, mm. There's so much uh, more that needs to be done and midwives need to be involved in the design development and the rollout. So, yeah, here we are and we're ready for the work. Great. Thank you. And Alison? Um, I think to reflect on what's getting in the way, um, if it's that the equipment isn't, you know, usable, I know we've got, you know, there's, <laughs> I'm sure everyone can relate about a laptop that only lasts, the battery lasts for half an hour and it's flat. Um, you know, if that's what's getting in the way, speak to the manager. If it's that the process or the system needs, you know, changing, bring your ideas to your CNCs and your educators. Um, clinicians need to be involved in in developing these systems so that they are user-friendly for clinicians. Um, Definitely. Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I'd say. Thank you. Thank you to you all for providing your perspectives and insights today. And thank you to those online who have come along to hear how digital technologies can enhance your midwifery practice. And we'll, we'll finish up now. See you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.